Namaskar. Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Ayer. After a long hiatus of several months, Sri Rajiv Malhotra ji is joining me again. We are going to talk about a very hot topic, Obama. And let's first uh, introduce our welcome our guest of the day, Sri Rajiv Malhotra. Ram Ram Rajiv ji, how are you? Ram Ram, wonderful to be on your show. Uh, yes, wonderful. Uh, a lot happened, and I put out this tweet immediately after Obama made that horrible statement. Uh, uh, yeah, so I thought uh, we should talk more about it. Yes, sir. And and this is not the first time Obama has uh, expressed such uh, views. In 2015, he did the same thing, and a very famous journalist, uh, his name is Charles Krautheimer, he slammed him. And now you are having one of the ex USC IRF commissioner who himself is an evangelist. His name is Johnny Moore. And he also said that India is a diverse country. We should celebrate its diversity. And, and what uh, Obama said was inappropriate. So clearly, he was goaded to make that statement. Take it away from there, sir. <clears throat> See, I want to drill deep uh, rather than just react to Obama in one uh, yes, sensational yes. episode and so on. I think uh, Modi's recent visit needs to be deconstructed in a more balanced way. Uh, the Indian media is mainly focused on the hoopla, the pageantry, the tamasha, you know, the all of that. Uh, very much carried away by the attention shown, the emotions, the hugging, a uh, lot of gala events. So let's. Uh, I'm more interested in what is policy, policy implications, rather than the persona, personality, pageantry, because that dies away quickly. What we are, what we, what matters is in the long run is the Substance, policy implication. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's talk about that, and then we'll put the Obama thing in context. You know, because I think it'll reveal something. If you if you look at let's the hype is that this is something unique and original, uh, one of a kind, and so many people hugged him and stood up and applauses and all that. But that is not unusual. I, first of all, the trip was very successful. I do want to say that a lot of good things came out. Uh, you, uh, 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 this uh, our PM, our whole government, Modi onwards are on the right track, uh, dealing with the U.S. in this way. Whether it's Republican or Democrat, that's fantastic. From the U.S. side, also India is a very important country. So, the fact that these things are happening is good news, and I'm very happy. But, but as far as the visit is concerned, you should remember that five prime ministers since independence have addressed the U.S. Congress. Uh, Nehru did. Rajiv Gandhi did, uh, Narsimha Rao did, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 this uh, Vajpayee did, and yeah. Manmohan Singh did. Now, if you look at the most recent one, which was Manmohan Singh, it was also a gala event, and every couple who was special at the dinner were introduced, like they're going to the Oscars, they were wearing all these great clothes, and the commentator saying, you know, this is a jewelry, this is the designer who designed this and that. And such and such item is on the menu. It was really analyzed in that way, like some big uh, celebrity affair, like a Oscar award going on, something like that. So there's nothing new. And also, when you look at uh, uh, the Americans applauding, this is true whenever there's a guest, you know, whenever whether it's a uh, Chinese, Japanese, European, Mexican, Indian, whatever. When there's a major guest, foreign dignitary, they do that. This is out of courtesy. Americans are very polite diplomatic people when it comes to showing this. But that's not the entire story about America. So Indians are very much into, they're easily impressed by this uh, hugging optics. and emotion yeah. optics. But Indians should remember that even in India, you know, when you go to Mamta Banerjee, I'm sure even uh, uh, if uh, Modi were to meet Mamta Banerjee, they'll have very nice, polite things and they'll you know, to say good things to each other, look after each other's family health and inquire and all that. That courtesy is there. Even in Indian society, it's not unusual about America. So I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that Indians don't pick it up as, hey, this is just part of the good cop. You know, you behave this way with, unless it's a diehard enemy, in which case you don't even invite them. So I think one should discount all that and look at the matters of substance. Now, the tweet I sent said that there's two postures of America towards India. One is a positive one, one is a negative one. And one should not lose track of that. The positive one was focused here and it was moved forward. And it has to do with US needs India for, against China uh, to keep the Indo-Pacific open. Uh, 
to uh, to counter china because uh, uh, china has become too powerful uh, both in technology and in commerce and military and geopolitics and all that and india india the dream for the american point of view we should understand what are they after the dream would be soldiers because you know the nato has doesn't have enough young people and they're not willing to put their own boots on the ground they are willing to give weapons and all that they would love it if india were to say that you know 1 lakh 2 lakh soldiers will put on the ground wherever you want but give us all this other stuff in return they would love it but of course that would be a mistake for india so they see india as a source of youth for something of this sort a source a ge- geographically india is very ideally suited uh, for as an ally because it's right in the middle of the indian ocean and and india has a lot to offer geographically from that point of view and india also you know in terms of commerce in terms of as a market has a lot to offer so those are positives that the us is building on this thing about they'll have more visas is not a big game changer it's okay and they'll open a few more embassy I mean, a few more consulates it's not a big deal that's okay the transfer of technology for the ge engine is a big deal that's a, that that can be a game changer in terms of giving a jump start for india's uh, aerospace industry india's own indigenous engine has not done well that project is not doing well so india needs kaveri to, kaveri yeah kaveri so india needs to import but you see this import is not 100% if you read between the lines the us congress said that uh, the, uh, the the uh, transfer of technology will be partial it, you can some people say 60% some people say 80% but it's no like close to 100% certain key aspects of the technology will be held back that that is where india needs to do reverse engineering the way china did and uh, use whatever we can learn to sort of get ahead and not not create a dependency on the us it should not be that from russian dependency now we become dependent on ge and people like that that can be turned off like this so one has to look at the positives with a with a pinch of salt and b- encourage them to build further on the positives i i'm very happy that uh, india is finally wanting to sit down with the us and talk in, you know how do we move things forward in a in, in in many in many domains and the us is also interested so that's that's one thing but you know the problems of breaking india forces wokeism uh all this human rights all this khalistan business all this uh, islamism uh, targeting in india all this dalit movement now based in harvard things that i've featured in my book snakes in the ganga cannot be wished away cannot be ignored you cannot assume that if we do enough positives the negatives will go away it doesn't work like that the forces that are and we'll come to obama as part of that the forces that are determined committed to this breaking india project since my early breaking india book first one dozen years ago and now snakes in the ganga these are getting stronger and stronger because the previous breaking india was at the grassroots level with villagers poor people uneducated people converting them and and now it is harvard going after the elites of india going after corporate india uh, bringing in indian billionaires to be on their side many of them were at this event also uh, some of the people celeb- some of the pe- people featured in this event uh, are people who have actually been in the breaking india side i mean i i can't name some because i know some of them but mahindra and all these guys were there too so they have not been taken to task they have not even bothered to respond to the discoveries we un- uncovered in-, in our research that they are funding the projects at harvard which are breaking india and these are projects concerning uh, you know uh, islamists and uh, dalit act dalit uh, calling themselves the blacks of india and the non dalits the whites of india these are projects concerning khalistanis or kind of things that go on at harvard harvard in the name of social justice does all that it has a right because it's a free society and it can do what it wants but indians don't have to go and fund it and we are funding it so you see none of that has been taken to task all that has been put aside and so the good cops the goody goodies are having a field day to make things look very nice and the media hasn't pointed out that the good cops are kind of uh, you know uh, uh, mesmerizing mesmerizing the indian public into sort of ignoring the bad things going on you see there are the bad cops obama part of them so this good cop work bad cop strategy is working 
for the Americans. Uh, use the good cops to say all these great things about, I mean, Biden playing that role. Many others, this uh, US Congress address, all the other di dinner events and so on. And so the Indian public is thinking, okay, now there is no more problem left. That bothers me. That problem hasn't gone away. That problem hasn't gone away at all and is not likely to go away. It's in fact getting worse. It is not just a George Soros. It's also the Omidyar. It's also 20 other people like that. It's also some of the big tech people, including Sundar Pichai's company, who is sitting there doing deals and all that with India. Google is part of all this, uh, including all these other tech companies and their AI and their social media control and the role they are playing in uh, in bringing out, uh, you know, breaking India Hindu phobic type voices uh, through their through their influence is something that has to be that has not yet been taken on. Indian Indian government, Indian authorities, Indian media, Indian public intellectuals have not done a good job of bringing that out. Now, now you come to who are these negative people, and where does Obama fit in? I think that was. That was your question. So, but I wanted to yes. clear the yes. ground. So, tell, so, so here is the thing. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, I have a virus. I'm fighting. So, I, I have to cough and drink some water once in a while. Uh, yeah, please go ahead, sir. I'll make a quick announcement while you drink a sip of water. Okay, please do that. Yeah. Viewers, um, small request for you to please like this video. And what Rajiv Ji and I are trying to bring about for you is a more balanced perspective. Mm -hmm. Yes, there were a lot of positives, but what are the other side uh, that needs to be discussed a little bit more? Um, because optics is one thing, but substance on the ground, what is India really getting? What are the uh, strings attached to it? All these things also have to be discussed. That's what we are trying to do here. And uh, please do like this video, like 10 times the number of people who are watching uh, should be watching this show. Please go ahead, sir. So, you know, when you look at uh, the negatives towards India from the U.S. policy point of view, the negatives are different for the Democrats and Republicans. When the, Demo when the Republicans are in power, you have the same positives. They want to be a counter to China and all those things. But the negatives are that uh, in a Republican administration, a lot of influence of the church they're not they're not happy about missionaries not being allowed to evangelize conversions and all that so the indian church has a lot of feed into feedback into the american think tanks indian church and a lot of the activists uh, aligned with it uh, in ngos have a direct link daily weekly i mean they're just part of one global network giving feedback sending them evidence sending them videos whether it's the us commission on religious freedom whether it's any uh, committee uh, in the Congress, whether it is some policy making, they are they have their their uh, their in, they've infiltrated the Indian Indian mind, the Indian uh, infrastructure, the Indian ecosystem, and they have data coming in all the time, which is a security risk also. So the Republicans are tapping into the Christian right, and this is feeding this whole business about uh, you know uh, the, the the Christians don't have rights and they're abusing you know Christian church and this and that. When the Democrats in power, it shifts to wokeism. It shifts to Islam being uh, abused, minority, uh, the Afro Dalit axis. Uh, it shifts to uh, uh, you know Khalistanis, things like that. So now that this is a, a democratic administration, you are seeing this kind of wokeism uh, waking up in a big way uh, against India. So behind the scenes of what you saw are a what is called demo progressive Democrats. Within the Democratic Party, they are the left wing fringe, and they are they are strong. I mean, you have some uh, some Congress women who decided to openly boycott Obama, uh, uh, Modi's trip very openly, and made very audacious press uh, uh, you know statements. Many Indians, there, many Indians included, some of them would come just to be nice and maybe even applaud once in a while. But what they are doing behind the scenes, who are, who is, who are the congressional interns working for them, what type of consultants they have, what type of hearings they do, 
you know if you if you really get to know these people it is a it is a snake pit it is a snake pit as far as india is concerned and these are people on government payroll they are democrats they are they're elected they have official the people that they hire on their staff uh, as government employees so the the us it, especially the democratic party is infested with anti india wokists the intellectual uh, gravitas coming from places like harvard stanford at you know mit and so on and a lot of think tanks supporting it and the political gravitas coming from the us government the congress and so on so when you see all this happening you know it is not a big deal at all that, uh, that uh, hey obama made this statement i mean he's just a well known person he carries a lot of weight christiana amanpour giving him the forum cnn is into this fareed zakaria is into this okay so the the breadth and depth of this anti india wokeist ecosystem is absolutely massive and this did not come out at all during the modi trip they put it aside so i am concerned that this is a way to make indians accept this wokeism as a new normal that hey you know this is the way life is uh, you know let's think of the good cops let's think of what we can do positively let's not worry about all the issues maybe they'll go away maybe they will inform we'll send them a box of mangoes they'll be happy with us you know all this kind of nonsense the fact of the matter is india has failed to take on the wokes head on explicitly take him on the way you know many other powers do the way china does so this is my view my opening statement on how i saw the modi modi visit overall very positive but the negatives left unaddressed to kind of simmer away under the sur- surface and get even worse thank you rajiv ji so there are many schools of thought about who really is running the biden administration i have been watching and i've been commenting about this almost on a daily basis uh, i think i started covering white house and us politics uh, around june 2020 about 6 months before the elections took place in 2020 and and i've been continuously following that and one saw at the beginning of the biden administration several 180 degree flip flops the administration would say one thing within 24 hours they'll reverse themselves so this kind of uh, behavior was observed which made us to predict that perhaps susan rice we have scaling specific name because this was mentioned in many of the daily global insight that i used to conduct with sridhar chetiala ji we used to mention that susan rice is the person who's taking orders from somebody outside and that is the person who's actually running the administration then 3 months ago susan rice got eased out let's very politely so today i am wondering whether the biden administration has decided to assert itself finally or is it still somebody else running or pulling the strings here your thoughts sir so you know biden wants re election i mean that's normal that's natural so he is going with it's like in india also the politician goes with what it takes to get elected and uh, you know now now the there is as far as india is concerned there's pressure from the pentagon and cia to sort of make amends because china china has become suddenly a very serious problem that Biden cannot ignore regardless of what Hunter Biden's relationship may have been uh, it is non ignorable both democrats and republicans uh, accept that and so this big huge looming reality called giant china uh, has to be taken uh, into consideration which was not the case uh, earlier on uh, biden was not as strongly against china he was doing lip service to it but he was not so much he was more anti russia than anti china he still kind of like that but you know the so one is the china factor the the unavoidable nature of what is happening with china and therefore the role of india has changed in the american foreign policy another thing is that uh, uh, you see the the uh, wokeists uh, basically is an alliance of the uh, ultra left providing the ideology and intellectual gravitas and soros type people providing the money a lot of the money uh, aligned with the with the islamists Uh, islamists and and african americans blacks and now they brought in the dalits and khalistanis so it is a it is, there's a lot of support political support financial support intellectual support camaraderie support emotional among these people they hang out together when when, when i send my people to attend some meetings and all that they come back and say that there's a lot of bhai bhai among these groups so this wokeist camp is a solid camp 
that is push, pulling people, uh, pulling the strings. And that is an important factor in who is running America. There is this kind of a voice. But on the other hand, there is the pragmatics of uh, military and uh, corporate interests and, uh, uh, you know, CIA and all that, which is leaning more towards India. So I, I see I see these two camps pulling the strings and some of the inconsistencies can be, you know, which string is pulled on a certain day. Now, uh, have you noticed how the White House Chief of Staff is almost unnoticeable? He's one of the quietest Chief of Staffs I've ever seen, sir. Hello? Are you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm yeah here. Okay. Did you hear my question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The White House Chief. So, you know, the, this, is, this is partly, I, I think Biden is not very functional in terms of his personal cognitive uh, capabilities. If you look at Biden as a younger man, he's a very fiery guy and a lot of things he had to say were very different than his policies today. Biden is not a newcomer. He's not a lightweight. He's a very heavyweight. He's a, he's a serious fellow. Uh, but I think he's over the hill. He's crossed past the tipping point. And he's a convenient person to put out there because he's this old uncle G, daddy G kind of grandfather kind of a personality. Uh, very lot of people feel sorry for him and so on. So there is a sympathy factor for him and uh, doesn't have a whole lot of personal scandal, dirty linen, other than this Hunter Biden thing. Uh, and so, you know, what is what is going on is uh, when you have a kind of a weak person uh, at the center who is not sort of calling the shots based on his own personal ideology, which is also very inconsistent, then you have an opportunity to fill the vacuum. And a lot of people are trying to fill the vacuum. And that is why there are many contenders. That there are many contenders behind the scenes. None of them want to come in the surface in above, other than Robert Kennedy Jr., who's come out openly, wants to, is running for against, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, against Biden, Biden yeah. within the within the Democratic Party. Other than that, you really don't have anyone wanting to do it openly. But behind the scenes, there is no, it is not like there is a consistency of uh, machinery and thinking, and then they put him in front. Behind him, there is no not, not that much of a consistency either because there, that wokest camp is a very powerful camp. But they cannot come out on every issue. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, now, you, you, you mentioned something very specific, which I have also touched upon in many of my monologues, which is the engine technology that is supposedly not being transferred as part of the, uh, the engine that's being given from General Electric to HAL. The engine technology specifically we are talking about was used in F-15, F-16s and so on and so forth. It is something specifically called crystal blade technology. And you mentioned one very important point. That is how good are Indians at reverse engineering a functioning part? How quickly can they reverse engineer it? I have read some data that last year one institute of technology claimed that they have actually reverse engineered the crystal blade technology. Um, how good is India in reverse engineering? Pharma, they have come out trumps. Absolutely. Very, very, uh, you know, it's, it's a chemical formulation that if you know how to break down the formulation, mm -hmm. you've got a, you know, a generic drug. Let's put it that way. How good is India in heavy engineering? Uh, so, you know, I'm disappointed because I'm disappointed. It's a very important point. Uh, we both come from a tech background. So, you know, yes. Indians are into the hearts, into the guts of the American tech banking system and or, you know any industry you look at it the, the tens of thousands of indians working there but indians did not reverse engineer and come up with our own apps our own operating system our own search engines the way chinese did i mean the the point is why is it that there's more we, we said that indians have an english language advantage over chinese we said that in software we said that indians are more creative we are free society they're totalitarian and society uh, software thrives when you are free people we said that so despite all these advantages that India had in its software industry, why is it that China is way ahead in AI, in all kinds of things when it comes to making products, when it comes to their own technology, their own proprietary know-how, their own patents? India is nowhere. So it, 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 we are good coolies. We are obedient. We will work, uh, we'll work for the master. We'll do whatever the, it takes. Why is it that Indians sitting in New York in the heart of the financial system and developing all the future technologies uh, did not come up with our own products. Why? Why we copy cap, copy captaining? Even you know, copying PayPal later on, copying Uber later on. We're always copying, but we're not coming up with our own original thinking. We are happy to get a good six-figure salary and uh, let uh, work for a, a company and let them 
you know take the risk and give us a reward so this is the problem and uh, and chinese have been mentored encouraged rewarded not for some so some soft power and all that but specifically for stealing technology now i'm not i'm using that word stealing it's a sensitive word i am not proposing that india should steal technology but you know there's a gray line gray line between uh, reverse engineering and saying okay i'm learning from you and i'm going to develop my own original idea and get my own patent versus saying i'm copying from you how is uh, being inspired by somebody's thinking and developing one's own is not theft it's not a violation of copyright or patent uh, so chinese are always arguing in legal courts also cases also that this is their own original work they have learned something from the americans and they have they have all the technology has been transferred to china for manufacturing purposes and for therefore they have understood the engineering to do manufacturing you need to know how the engineering was done and once you know the how the engineering was done you can reverse engineer and do your own engineering which is what china is doing so china had this plan that whenever they work with the, an american client a certain portion of the profit they make is a secret or a side project to reverse engineer whatever they're learning in their own name so if they are building cars or parts for cars they will build their own car if it is aerospace they build their own aerospace whatever it is they are doing india doesn't have that culture india has a culture of obedient obedient uh, people who working for the client and there is no side show so how do you create a side show not visible that's a new cultural thing for india how would you do that absolutely in fact i'm going to ask through this <coughs> show a specific question to ratan tata and anand mahindra are you manufacturing your own engine in india can you please answer this question by way of comments user viewers i encourage you if some of you are working in these companies you can weigh in you can always use anonymity if you don't want to be get caught because my information is that both these companies who make very good cars are not manufacturing their own engines rajiv ji this is where we are see that is the truth if we can't even make our own car automobile engines where is the question of making a, a you know airplane aircraft engine i mean if you look at the crystal blade technology and the problems it solves a functioning crystal blade engine can run 25000 hours if you think of an one air sortie as one hour that is 25000 trips yeah this is this is what i had done i had done a little bit of a deep dive into crystal blade technology what does it involve this is what is the crown jewel of the general electric this is, they bought it from pratt and whitney when they bought uh, pratt and whitney they got all this stuff now this is allegedly better than even the rolls royce engine that uk makes and anything that russians have made ever so uh, these th th these are the thing the leftmost was the first evolving product of crystal blade the right one is called single crystal blade this is supposedly the best uh, engine uh, uh, technology that you can think of and it is my belief that india is not getting this this is the part that is being left out of the agreement and this is what india needs to reverse engineer now so i i want to just set the reality expectations for our viewers it's all nice to feel good about all these things if we don't even make our own car engine i mean but you know that has but, been you know, yeah go ahead but you know sri you know, i'll tell you there was a time when during the time of bhaba uh, the same thing happened with the atomic energy and india reverse engineered and built it made, made a lot of uh, you know india still not got the best there is but india's got the pretty good uh, nuclear, uh, atomic energy you know capability and similarly with the help of because of the leadership of satish dhaban uh, similarly in isro india was able to do get a lot of self sufficiency Uh, still i mean there is it's a it's a it's a challenge to keep up with the elon musks and do, do those kind of things but you know isro and uh, bark are two good examples of reverse engineering and putting india on the map i wish india would do that in all these other technologies whether it's aerospace whether it is ai whether it is quantum computing you know china bet 10 years ago on uh, eight or nine or 10 uh, major technologies which will shape the future and they said that in all these technology we want to be number one that was their goal and it was stated in the in the communist party manifestos and all that in their in their it's not like they were doing it secretly so they had artificial intelligence they had uh, uh, you know quantum computing they had uh, robotics they had uh, solar uh, they had nanotechnology 3d printing i mean they had all these kind of things 
and in almost all of them china if not number 1 they're number 2 and they want to get, become number 1 so you know it it has to do with national policy towards r and d what is happening with our science and technology people i mean what what is going on and and so uh, we have so much and why is the private sector not being held accountable that they have made their money on wage arbitrage they hire somebody for 10000 dollars yes, they hire yes, yes. rent him out yes. for 30 40000 they make money and they become billionaires and they have yachts and aircraft and they have mansions all over and we give them padma awards because we think they must be great actually they have rented the indian brain to make money they just brains for hire but they have not reinvested it in r and d why is it that geo not rather than developing our own uh, chat gpt want to build on top of the american chat gpt why is it that rather than building our own search engine they wanted to build on google why is it that rather than having our own whatsapp they want to use uh, you know the whatsapp of facebook why is it that we are always saying that gora saab is superior will will ride on his shoulders you know gora saab you are well very good you are superior please include me i want to hang off of your shoulder and you take me forward why is it that we need somebody else's shoulder this is the quintessential difference between china and india chinese do not want to depend on anybody else's shoulder they will depend they will they will depend but they'll betray you they will depend for a while as a sh short term strategy they will say i need you i will suck up to you i'll kiss ass i'll do whatever the hell you want you can abuse me i'll put up with it but i have a secret project going in the on the side to actually one day not depend on you and then i'll come there and say hey guy i'm an equal that's where china is today because they paid that price for 25 years and india has been living the good life thinking that we have reached become superpower this that and all that it, you know we are nowhere close to being a superpower because a superpower has to be autonomous your power has to be independent and not contingent on somebody else giving you that power as long as your power is be, uh, dependent on either russia or america or somebody you you cannot say that we are a superpower so basic strategic thinking has to happen so i would like to ask you a different question like yes, you sir. asked like you asked who is really running the biden administration i would like to ask who is really running the modi administration good question um, I mean, isn't, is, are... isn't that isn't that a fair question i mean i like modi i think he's the best prime minister we've ever had and and not only historically but i would say today the best candidate there is and also looking at objectively during his last 8 9 years he's done an amazing amazing job i mean he's got wide bandwidth of interests and talents from dharma to practical technology to being able to run elections and win elections and being an international statesman he's a super superhero and and he, he deserves all that but i am saying that uh, it's strategic issues like this wokeism that we've been talking about like right now i just heard that uh, uh, they've outsourced to azim prem ji this business of uh, textbooks i don't know if that is true is that true no i don't think so sir i don't think so there are lots <laughs> of these kind of flow stories float around i don't think that is true but let me ask you let me let me tell you a couple of things that modi has tried to do which the indians have not picked up i'll give you an example rajiv ji Two years ago, uh, there was a new policy that was uh, brought out saying that if you establish a Vedic university, you get all kinds of benefits. Now we all know that, uh, except for some pockets in Banaras, Kumbakonam in uh, deep south, Madhur area near Karnataka, and perhaps some areas and pockets in Maharashtra, there is no Vedic adhyayan going on. There is something called Bhashangam, which is Bhasha Anga. In, in Sanskrit, right, the same word means different things. So you need to really understand the sentence to understand what the word is saying. So this is a this is a research that goes on, Bhashanga. All these things are not actually happening now. So when the opportunity arose to establish Vedic universities, I don't see anybody doing it. So Modi can turn around and say, look, I am putting you, you know, I'm giving you the road. Nobody's driving on it. So there are some of these challenges. But I used to think that Modi was being influenced by others until until he decided to buy crude from Russia at a much lower price, braving all the pressure from the West. You saw how many heads of state came visiting India, trying to persuade him to not do that, and he stuck to it. So if he was being influenced by somebody else, how could he have done that? And he's actually gotten away with it. He has gotten away with buying S-400 from Russia. He is now, people are saying, okay, okay, I think you guys have perfected the refining technology. Whenever there's a short fill, you guys can come in and fill the West European and America's requirements. This is the uh, crude technology I'm talking See, about. I, I so, fully agree. I fully agree yeah. that the India's policy on Ukraine and balancing out is wonderful. And Modi gets full credit for it. I fully agree. 
and i also feel that on as far as international is concerned nobody can pull his strings he's trying to create this neutral thing which is very good i'm looking at it domestically i'm looking at it are there international forces breaking india forces who put their people in who put their people into the indian infrastructure corporate through esg diversity equity inclusion training programs putting hr departments into the corporate world putting people into niti aayog these all these big five consulting companies western consulting companies getting their people in the think tanks you know i'm looking at uh, to what extent are these kind of people pulling the strings and they are they are not in the officially directly in the name of uh, a foreign power but the point is they are bringing a foreign point of view not a vedic point of view so if you look at the influence that india has through uh, through these international consultants you know whether whether they are consulting for niti aayog and the various ministries whether they are consulting for the corporate india their influence is huge and why is in why is in india able to do its own consulting why we can do consulting for other countries why can't we do our own consulting why can't niti aayog do our own thing why can't esg be an indian index which which defines society uh, you know environment governance according to our principles why not so i i think that we are resorting to western universalism indirectly in a very deep at a deep level and this is what troubles me very true um the the final answer to your question is that there are things that modi applies his mind to it and you see that originality of thought come through but most of the things i think it delegates it to bureaucrats and he listens to them and and he just goes along with their advice this is where the danger is this is where the danger is there are lots of people who have you know their own agendas i'll tell you sir national stock exchange it's a rot it's it's a mess and mr chidambaram has completely captured it and he continues to wield extra power there and and every case that is brought along full of holes so it collapses in the courts so these are all done by bureaucrats pushing pens and making sure that enough holes are left in the logic so that it's easy to break it down in a court so these kinds of things modi administration has not at all looked at things and rajiv ji for 5 years or 6 years now i've been presenting data with proof saying these are these are all the people that you need to fire i only saw three or four people go that's it See, what what i would like is modi should become the president of india he should win this election as pm at the end of that term he should become president of india and have a successor become pm so now as a president of india he's got special powers which have never been used under the constitution the president of india can do a lot of things and the the president so far have been more like rubber stamps there's no small, strong personality if modi became president of india he could actually um, not only amend but rewrite large parts of the constitution he could have a new constitutional assembly he could do so many things to kind of redesign reengineer india's dna modern india's dna and he's the guy kind of guy who could do that i wish he would he would take that up as an idea that maybe as a president he's got more power than as prime minister he could very 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 uh, out of the left field thought rajiv ji and i think uh, people should think about what you just mentioned and i think we're at a the point where we can probably take a few questions because i know you are concerned about you know keeping it to less than an hour so we're going to take a few questions viewers uh, if you have not liked this video please do so if you are not subscribed to our channel please do so please click on the bell button for notification let's take some questions now thank you rona thakur thank you gauri kulkarni sri ayer ji and sri rajiv malhotra ji hats off to the two of you for doing what you do i really appreciate your work and try to promote as much as i can so much we can learn from both of you thank you so much namaskar thank you mithul panchal how come kennedy bush clinton obama family have more than one presidential candidates is it not feudalism if not how and why if yes how and why well it's not feudalism because uh you have more than one person in your family but they have to go through the electoral system nothing nothing says that you cannot have more than one person if they use the family clout to get the other person elected yes that would be a, a, a different problem unless you can prove that you know then then that it's a family like we have a jati structure and there's a jati of musicians there's a jati of dancers there's a jati of uh, fishermen there's a jati of whatever so you know jatis can have some skill uh, within the family within the extended family 
and so why not political why not a kshatriya jati why couldn't you say that these are kshatriya jatis in america and they are they are continuing this type of focus and education into the next generation there's nothing wrong with that next question please thank you amit karnik uh, sri sir jai hind to your thoughts obama is keen to make his wife future us president how tangible is this scenario um, i don't think i don't think it's tangible because i think uh, Michelle Obama doesn't want to. She's given up all these opportunities, and uh, at least as of now, her thinking is she didn't even want uh, Barack to be. He wanted. She wanted Barack Obama behind the scenes, uh, politically. I don't think she's cut out for that. I don't think she's a very smart person, but she's too wokeist, and it'll be too. It'll be taking the country too far to the left if she were to run for office. Yeah, I think even the mod, uh, the Democrats are trying to swing more moderate now. They feel like the progressives have basically hijacked their agenda, and that is actually coming to bite them in the wrong place. Uh, Roshan wants to know. Thank you, Roshan. Mahindra is manufacturing its own gasoline engine, produces 200 bhp. It's fantastic. Mahindra has refined diesel engine from mm -hmm. diesel engines from AVH Austria, but Tata engines are from Fiat and EV batteries from CATL China. So basically, they are you know uh, adding to what I had observed. That India doesn't make its own engines for even the automobiles. Yeah, there's a big market, 10,000 cars a year no, or but, something like no, that. No, no, but you know, the thing is that by the time you master the the uh, internal combustion engine, it's being replaced by EVs. So India needs to know how come China took all the most of the patents on the electric vehicles technology. That's the engine of the future. You know, so it's the battery technology, hydrogen hydrogen technology, these kind of things. You have to get into the ground floor of a new cycle of R&D, which is AI, which is quantum computing, which is all these new semiconductor uh, approaches. India needs to be into that. And as far as jet engines are concerned, India really needs to understand what it takes to build a futuristic jet engine uh, ourselves and learn as much as you can from the GE as you possibly are able to. Next question, Dr. Chetan, thank you so much. ISRO after BARC, ye dono government organizations hain. Yahan par log government job paane ke liye jate hain. Yahan par kuch bhi world class research nahi hota hai. Ye pas, uh, pom, possible hi nahi hai. So, I think BARC has outlived. Yes, BARC was in the first few decades was in dynamic. ISRO, something similar happening also. You know, ISRO has lost its dynamism. So, but these these kind of organizations serve a purpose for the first you know few decades and then they may just become like sarkari and then you need to shake them up or privatize them or do something else but as far as new technologies are concerned a lot has happened since the the era of atomic energy and the era of space many new technologies we've been talking about exist india is not there so india needs to do something drdo needs to shake up shape up drdo needs to learn from darpa the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency in the United States that invented most of the breakthroughs that the U.S. had in the last 40, 50 years. DAR, DAR, DRDO needs to be that kind of futuristic R&D center. Thank you, VG, VJRDY. Why is the Indian government not doing anything about the open society and other NGOs against India functioning in India? So that is a good question. <coughs> Excuse me. So that is what I meant by asking who is pulling the strings. You see, who is pulling the strings? So there has to be some bold, defined action. And and in Snakes in the Ganga book, I've exposed many such organizations besides just Soros, who is already well known. Next question, please. Mr. Barani wants to know, what's your take on how government is handling the Breaking India scheme now? Are they taking it seriously in your opinion these days? How are the Indian billionaires doing on the foreign university issue? So the billionaires are having a free run. And nobody has taken them to task. Off the record, I'm told that, you know, their money is needed to run elections. How can you, how can you call up a Mahindra and say, hey, listen, stop doing this because he's the one supplying money for elections. I mean, that's what I'm told. I don't, I don't have any details. But, you know... This is the problem. The billionaires also own media, all this large mainstream media owned by Indian billionaires, social media owned by foreign billionaires, traditional media owned by Indian billionaires. 
so this is this is controlling the minds of indians uh, po politicians know that if they misbehave some media guy can expose them if it is social media then some guy sitting in the us can expose if it is mainstream media some rich guy owning the media can expose so there is a kind of an equilibrium you know kind of understanding between the political elite and the you know business elite you can't mess too much with them of course the political elite can have a, a, a you know a, a raid a tax raid or enforcement raid or some kind of a raid on the businessman and the businessman of course has the gun on his head the other guy's head because he can expose him in some kind of a media sense so that's how the country is being run and that's not you, you things are not safe enough secure enough to take on foreign uh, nasty people like open source and soros and many others like that steel plan babai wants to know if india doesn't respond with iron fists on the murmurs about indian democracy it will eventually gain momentum to drive yeah. policy making against indian interests your thoughts sir yeah and i i'm afraid that may be happening uh, an example like in the sex in the ganga is against indian interests are the kind of output coming out of harvard but nobody is able to stop it we have named names we got a separate chapter on each of these uh, centers the mahindra center chapter uh, there is a piramal center chapter like that many chapters it's a big book with many chapters and we've exposed so much we have talked about what uh, godrej is doing what uh, prem ji is doing like that but nobody stopped them so you know we can talk all we want but who has the ability the clout the the actual power to do something they have to step in and do something um last question tony stark wants to know as india don't have a record of reverse engineering and don't want to angry the us do you think the end of made in india dream no indian fighter jet will fly with indigenous engine till 2100 as ge deal well i i hope it's not that far <laughs> i i mean 2100 is a long time i mean i hope that uh, that now the thinking of india is becoming more confident and india you know maybe you get 75 80% of the technology transfer you'd learn that uh, that you try and have a parallel reverse engineering to try and figure out the remaining 25% and you try and get more uh, 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 you know why is it that indian brains are working in these companies like ge you know a lot of you go to ge r and d lot of indians there it's not like we don't have the brains why is it that we cannot organize the same brains ourselves this is the thing i think it has to do with risk reward ratio the indian billionaires don't want to take the risk that comes with r and d this is an important point uh, sri that you should mention you should highlight it's yes. easy to import technology that has already been proven and pay some royalty or some margin or whatever and make a lot of profit from a billion plus 1.4 billion people who want the technology for their lifestyle it's a nice job nice role to have and become a big hero that you know you're doing all this and you become richest guy and all that but it takes more courage as a nation builder to say that i'm going to take a 25 to 50% of all the profit we make and i'm going to reinvest it in futuristic technologies which are risky i may make money i may lose money but i'm going to lift the r&d standard of the whole country this needs to be done one of the strengths of the united states technologically is that universities are centers of r&d not just teaching research and the professors are given grants research grants from industry our indian industries should give grants to the top 20 30 50 uh, r&d science and technology institutes 50 give them research grants on merit expect original research to be done by them the students will then become part of the professor's research grant when i was doing my work in the 1970s my professor had a grant from the pentagon you know for some research and i, and I had to get security clearance to work for him on a student visa i was so excited that wow and here i am an indian guy sitting in united states my professor is doing all this high flyer research and i'm part of it it gives you this uh, courage and confidence indian students all they are doing is memorizing learning passing exam to go get a job and then go somewhere else but there is no why aren't our billionaires investing in research centers in universities to produce the next generation research using professors and students helping them out and then thereby creating careers also for them 
Thank you, sir. I have done the same thing in the 80s, so I know exactly what you're saying. I had to get my security clearance. I was working on an Air Force project. So, yes, uh, it was great feeling that, you know, you're part of something much bigger, that they trust you with uh, your intellect to do something. And, you know, th these are all good days. I mean, you, you're absolutely right on. Many students that went through the university systems in U.S. in the 70s and 80s, when they were actually part either RAs or TAs, they got these kinds of opportunities. So thank you so much, Rajiv Ji. Today, I believe viewers, we have given you a 360 degree perspective of this India uh, Modi trip to uh, US. Good things, but there are also lots of things that need to be uh, cognizant of. India needs to, it needs to do a lot of work in the background. And where do we go from here? How do we all pull together? That's a question India needs to be asking itself. Certainly there's a good leader, he has good intentions. You know, I can't say the same of many others. Uh, so this is where we stand today. Let us wait and see how things develop. Rajivji, I would like to bring you back in maybe about four to six weeks time again, where we can review this and see where things stand. Thank you once again, sir. Namaste. Namaste.